Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. How is everybody? Good. That's good. How many of you plan to watch the Super Bowl next week? Yeah. I'm curious. Uh, for those of you just, they, they love the game, the, you know, the, the game itself. If you watch the Super Bowl strictly just for the game, raise your hand. I'm curious. All right. How many of you say, I only watch it for the commercials? Look at this. <laughs> Twice as many. Isn't it interesting when, when you're uh, with some friends and you're watching the game uh, during the Super Bowl, I've noticed this, that everybody talks during the game, and then when the commercials come on, they all stop, <laughs> right? It's opposite. But um, I did see on Facebook uh, some church, uh, I don't know where, not, not, not anywhere local, but uh, their outside billboard, um, it said um, how many times the, the Super Bowl teams are mentioned in the Bible, and it said Patriots 0, Eagles 33. So, I don't know. So if that's the score, then we know God's involved. <laughs> but did you know the Monday after the Super Bowl, an estimated 1.5 million people will call in sick? Isn't that crazy? An estimated 1.5 million. And the, the Super Bowl day is the second largest food consumption day of the year behind Thanksgiving. It is a massive day of guacamole and chips. Hey, um, speaking of the commercials, 10 years ago, um, a 30-second ad was approximately $2.7 million for a 30-second ad. This year, it's a, a, approximately going to be about $5 million for the 30-second spot, prime time, during the Super Bowl. So that is, per second, $166,000. Isn't that awesome? I'd love to pay off my house in one second. That'd be great. <laughs> Um, some of the things we, I love about the, the Super Bowl, obviously, are the commercials. And um, sometimes, whether it's Super Bowl or not, when, when there's a driver, somebody driving a car, um, there's always like a .07 size font of a little, like, safety warning. Have you guys ever noticed those before underneath the driver? And so I pulled out a few of them. They're, they're going to be hard for you to see, but I want to read what these are telling us. It says, professional driver, closed course, always obey speed limits. Thank you for the help with that. The second one, this is one of my favorite. It says, professional driver on a closed course. Do not attempt. Always drive within your ability and experience level consistent with conditions. I don't think that'll fly with a police officer, right? That was me. That was me driving. Right you? You're not, your mic's not on. That, yeah. That, sorry. This doesn't normally happen, but that was me driving right there, so. Hey. Uh, we, I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but we have a problem. Uh, you know, our grass parking is not always the greatest uh, in any way, but somehow we got like three cars run together, and the easiest way to resolve the problem, they haven't hit each other, is to have one person move their vehicle. So in a minute when no one's looking, sneak out. <laughs> if you own a Dodge Ram minivan on the grass, license plate BZJ692, we got cars boxed in and from the early service. That would help us. And when you get in your car to move it, please don't do this. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> so to follow up real quick, um, I, I wish I would have been able to use this excuse with a police officer one time because I was, as a youth pastor up in Spencer, Iowa, I was dropping off some kids um, after, you know, time hanging out, and it was probably 11 o'clock at night, and um, it had, there was a massive snowstorm, so there's like four or five inches on the streets in Spencer that hadn't plowed yet, I was dropping kids off, and um, I decided, you know, I can, I can do a little donut, nobody's going to see, you know, so uh, I did this with kids from my church in my car, mind you. Um, <laughs> And somebody did see it. It was a police officer several blocks away. So he pulls me over and he gives me a ticket for reckless driving. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I was perfectly in control. I knew exactly what I was doing. That was not reckless driving. So uh, the final one, uh, this is funny. It says, Fictional fictionalization, professional driver on a closed course. Do not attempt. Cars cannot fly. <laughs> Come on, man. So um, the tension here today is this, is that we need to be careful not to view ministry in the church the way that the captions are speaking in the commercials, where it says, do not attempt, professionals at work, um, leave it to somebody else. That's not who we are here at New Hope. New Hope is very unique. Um, we are employee-owned. If this is your church, you own it. This is part of you. Just 
uh, Friday, someone was coming in to clean, and I thanked them for cleaning. They said, yeah, just do my part, man. If, if, you know, we all have a small part to play to make New Hope run the way it is, and that's exactly the heart behind it. Um, that we don't believe that ministry is left up to the, just the pastors and a few leaders here. If that's the case, it's, you're like a spectator and it's boring, right? You just come in, you buy your time, and you leave. Um, we believe that everybody is a part of something, that uh, if this is our church, we should take care of it, that we can join efforts, we can accomplish so much more if more people are involved, and, and we're all in the, on this together, rather than just a couple people doing it. So um, I want to have Pastor Jeff come up and share just a quick story. He has been on staff uh, here at New Hope since 1997. Um, he's our co-senior pastor, and I wanted him to share just real quick a, a f- interesting story of when he interviewed here back in 1997. So it's hard to believe, but 20 and a half years ago, we came for an interview here from a church in Montana. And uh, my experience on the first day when we were interviewing, we were sitting in the conference room in the other, the other building over here. And that day, that afternoon, as we were meeting in the conference room, I met three different people uh, who were coming to the church just to do their part. So the first person I met was Randy Stevenson. Randy was in the early service. Uh, Randy is retired now, but he was a judge at the time. And when I met Randy, Jeannie and I met Randy, he was covered with sweat, uh, grass clippings down his legs, and cut off jeans with grass stained shoes. He was here uh, mowing the lawn. And this was, this was the first person I met outside the pastoral staff. And then, um, who else was I talking about? Julie, Julie Spencer. Oh, Julie Spencer, yes. Julie was there. I met Julie that day. And Julie had come in, and I remember you wearing scrubs. Would that, does that make sense? Were you, would you have been wearing scrubs? I don't know what you were doing at the time. But anyway, Julie had come in because there was a broken chair in the conference room, and she was working on putting a chair back together. And uh, so I met Julie that day. And uh, Denny and Rhonda Phillips uh, were coming in carrying uh, two uh, little buckets with cleaning supplies, and they were coming in to clean the bathrooms and clean the toilets. And these are my, my first people that I met at New Hope. And our, our, um, our experience, and this isn't to put that church down, but I think the majority of churches are like this, where about 20% of the people do the majority of the work. And in the little church where we were at, we hired people to clean the church. We hired uh, someone to do the lawn. That was me. And uh, so that, that's kind of how things work. When we came here and saw all the people involved in ministry and had a place in the church serving somewhere, I thought, this seems too good to be true. And it was just amazing. When I, when I got here and met people, I found out this is really what New Hope is all about and what we were so excited about, that uh, there were people who, this is their church. They give, they serve, they give of their time, their talent, but they just serve and serve each other. And it's an amazing thing. Glad to be part of this great church. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Um, speaking of Pastor Jeff, he's a great servant. Just on Thursday, he volunteered just to go visit uh, someone who needed help cleaning out their house. Um, someone who physically just wasn't able to, and he just willingly went and did it. So I, I had him share that with you today because I want you to know that this isn't something new that we're just starting. New Hope has been employee-owned since day one. This is, this is our church. We've been, we've been a part of it. Um, and so we have so many people that are involved here in ministry. I know a lot of you are already very involved in it. I do, I do want to take a moment and say thank you uh, for making New Hope one of a kind. It is, it's a unique place, um, the fact that you can be involved in so many different ministries and opportunities. Um, in, your, in your bulletin, there was a, a list of different ministries that are here. And I do want to highlight just a couple of them so I can explain a little bit about them. First of all, it says, you know, there's the NH Java, the coffee ministry. This is team of people. They prep the coffee on Saturdays. Uh, there's other people that on Sundays, they're helping run it, maintain it, keep it clean, all that kind of stuff. Um, our Blessing Garden, just north of here, the church owns some property, and there's a garden there, and we have individuals that serve every summer, and the produce goes to the Urbandale Food Pantry. Um, the Landscape Maintenance Team, it's beautiful out there, especially in the summertime. It looks gorgeous. It looks meticulous, and uh, some individuals um, work on that. It, none of us pastors touch it because we would destroy it. But there's some people that do a great job, and, um, and that takes place. One of them that isn't on there that we, that we didn't um, get on this piece of paper says the communion prep team. So there's people, like when we take communion on, on Sunday mornings or maybe for like the annual business meeting, uh, there's a team of people that come in the day before, a couple of days before they get everything ready. That's one time a month they do that. We care. You'll see that on there. Several people from New Hope, they're shut in. They cannot get out as easily. And so um, you would volunteer like an hour or maybe two two hours a month 
to be able to go and visit the same person each month and just build a relationship with them and be a friend to them. First impressions. These are the people that you see when you first pull up here. They're out in the parking lot telling you where to park. <laughs> they're, they're directing the traffic, rain, sleet, snow, whatever it may be. They're out there. They're being faithful to it. And uh, even like the golf carts, when it, the weather's bad, they're running people on golf carts. That's our first impressions team. Um, th- like Pastor Jeff mentioned, the cleaning team. All of our facilities, picture this real quick, guys. All of our facilities are cleaned by volunteers. That's massive. This is a huge undertaking that, um, that we, we probably could hire it out, but when someone has, you know, the willingness to serve, it becomes your church. You know what I mean? Like, you own it. You take care of it. And the great thing is, not only just cleaning, but all these ministries are like bite-sized portions. So you may come and say, I'd love to clean. Um, and they may say, all right, you, you're in charge of like vacuuming up here or whatever it may be. It's small enough to where within an hour or so, between Thursday and Sunday, you're here uh, and you clean. And the great thing is, is that it, it's, it's manageable. And so obviously there's so many more I don't have time to mention to them. But um, Pastor Austin made me aware of a, a story. So I called um, this person. They're a business owner here in church. And I asked them um, if this is true. And they said yes, uh, that all of their positions at their business are filled. They're staffed completely. And I don't know if they've ever been able to be at that point until now. But they're staffed. In fact, they have applications waiting to be called in case you know, they have an opening. And uh, Pastor Austin and I got to thinking, what if that was the case here at New Hope? How great would that be that, that someone else isn't able to teach? And so we have a list of subs ready to go. Or the cleaning person, they have to take a break because, you know, th- to care for an ill family member, something like that. And we have somebody just ready to go to jump in. That would be wonderful. That would be awesome. And I, I share all of this stuff with us today, not to guilt anybody whatsoever. Please hear my heart. The what I want to share with you guys today is this, is that I want us to understand that the church works best when every person serves. The church works best when everybody's involved, when everybody's serving. Matthew 20, 28 tells us that Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. He didn't come to be served by us or by the disciples. He came to serve. And so today, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13. I want us to look at the life of Jesus and the example that he has set for us. So while you're turning there, let me explain what's happening. Jesus is with his disciples. It's the Last Supper. They're eating together. This is the night before Jesus is going to be betrayed, arrested, and killed. And he's showing, the Bible says, the full extent of his love. He's wanting to communicate to his disciples some very important information. He wants his disciples to serve each other, and he wants us to do the same. So let's read John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and became, uh, began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said, uh, said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, I, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath only needs to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said that not everyone was clean. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And look at verse 17. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. 
So the question to ask today is this, is what did Jesus show us as he served? What is Jesus showing us as he served? I realize there's a lot more to the story, maybe that we, we have time to get into, but the first thing that Jesus shows us as he serves is compassion. If you're right, taking notes, you can write that down, compassion. See, uh, back, back in Jesus' time, it was very customary to wash feet when you entered into a home. The roads back then were dusty and dirty, so on dry seasons, you might be walking through a couple inches of dust. And on the rainy seasons, it's liquid mud, right? Um, it's, it's not the cleanest of places. You don't have these, these muck boots type thing that you can just walk around and protect your feet. Uh, your shoes were sandals, basically a sole with a couple straps over your feet, and that was the best that they had, if anything. And so when you would enter into a home, there was a water basin there. There's typically a servant that had a towel ready to go to wash your feet because you were entering into someone's home. So they, they took a lot of attention to be able to wash feet, kind of like you and I do for washing hands before a meal. You know, I tried to tell my kids like, all right, as you're eating, has anybody washed their hands? No, I didn't, Dad. And so they go off, wash their hands. Um, the same type, type of thinking that was what was being put into place for washing feet. So here's what happened. If there was no servant when you walked into the house, if there was no servant, then the host typically would do the honors of washing feet. And if there's no host, then usually what happened was the first person who entered into the home was the one who took those responsibilities on. So you're the first one that enters into that meal that night. Um, you, you understand that's kind of customary. No one else is here to do it. So I'll do, the, I'll do that and I'll wash someone's feet. And that's usually what happened, but not this crowd. See, Jesus knew that these disciples, they had an attitude problem, and they were not compassionate to one another. Think about this. Why didn't somebody else grab the water? Why didn't someone else grab the towel and start doing this? Why was it Jesus? I do want you to notice that it said uh, Jesus got up from the meal. So that means this meal's already happened. Knowing that, that it should have already been done washing feet, and no one still had done it. No one took initiative to get up and, and to wash the feet from the beginning before they even ate. And so Jesus, in the meal, gets up to do this. It's kind of like in your place of employment, you walk in, you see a dirty restroom, and you turn a blind eye and hope someone else sees it, right? Ah, I don't really have time. I don't want to clean anything in here today. Someone else is going to do that. That's not my job. That's the attitude that these disciples were having. I don't want to do this. So Jesus realized that they were more concerned about their rights and their needs. Uh, these guys were arguing about who would be greatest. And this wasn't the only time that they were arguing about it. So Jesus understands that they don't care for each other like he wants them to. So in the final hours of Jesus' life, with the disciples focused on themselves, when Jesus needed the most comfort, he got none. Most of us, if we're in the, the position that Jesus was, we would have felt sorry for ourselves. We, if we realized this was the final hours of our life, we would have said, guys, you have no idea what's about to take place. You need to be serving me. You need to be feeding me, washing my feet, all this kind of stuff. Jesus did not have that kind of attitude. In fact, he volunteered to do the job that nobody else wanted to do. I love in verse 1 how it says he now showed them the full extent of his love. He was more concerned in this moment, more compassionate for his disciples than his own. Jesus was neglected. He was hurting. He was being taken for granted. He was facing death. Do we love in the manner the way that Jesus loves? Do we have compassion for people the way that Jesus had compassion for his disciples? Are we more concerned for others than ourselves? Mark 12, 29 to 31 shares this. Jesus has been asked what is the greatest commandment, and he says um, in verse 30, actually, we'll just jump to that. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your stre strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater, co no commandment greater than these. Um, I, I do want to challenge us in this thought. Let's don't perfect the first commandment and neglect the second one. We can perfect loving Jesus, but then when we have to live it out and we have to love our neighbor, that's different, right? And love our neighbor as the way we love ourselves, that's, that's calling an extra level out of us. Notice in the story in John chapter 13, Jesus washed all the feet. He didn't leave anybody out. Judas was there. Jesus knew Judas was going to sell him out. He already had decided he was going to do that to Jesus. And so can you imagine Jesus when he gets to the feet of Judas? And he has to wash his feet? 
If it were me, I might say, ah, hold on a moment, dude, I need to go switch out the water. Go turn up the heat a little bit, you know, come back a little bit hotter than everybody else's. You say, all right, stick them in, buddy. It's going to be a whole lot hotter where you're going. <laughs> you know, that type of thing. That's, that's our flesh rising up, right? We don't have much compassion. If someone's our enemy, if someone's mean to us, they turn their back on us, whatever it may be, we try to stick it to them, but not Jesus. I want us to realize today that it's difficult to be a Christ-like servant without Christ-like compassion. It's very difficult to be a a Christ-like servant without the compassion of Jesus flowing out of us. Listen, if the the love of Jesus is not flowing out of us when we're serving, we're we're gonna run dry, we're gonna be frustrated, it's gonna be self-focused, and we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna walk away empty-handed. And we're not gonna see the fact that we can be a blessing to somebody. If you've ever been on a missions trip or if you've ever served somewhere and you gave without expecting anything in return, you almost walk away feeling more blessed, don't you? It's, there's something unique about it. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to say in the last verse of this, of 17. You'll be blessed if you do these things, if you serve people. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter in the Bible that we refer to. But um, it talks about this, in, starting in verse 1. Um, I want to read it to you. It says, If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but I don't love, I'm only a resounding go- gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't love, I'm nothing. Verse 3, it says, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Listen, if we don't have love and threaded through what we do here, we're going to be frustrated. Being a Christ-like servant means we need to have Christ-like compassion. So not only did Jesus show us compassion, but he also showed us humility. He showed us how to be selfless in this story. So visualize this with me. Nobody's washed feet yet. So Jesus, unannounced, gets up and takes off his outer garment, grabs a towel, g- grabs the water, and starts washing Starts washing the feet. So here's the Son of God uh, taking off the outer garment, being left with maybe just like a long undershirt, um, looking like a servant. Like when you would walk into a home, this is what a servant would be wearing possibly. And so he does this. He grabs a basin and begins to wash the feet. And this is something that no master usually did. This was reserved for servants or the, the hosts. And so Jesus, he has all the power under him, given to him, and yet he humbles himself and does something that a servant would do, and he washes dirty feet. How many of you have ever been um, taught a lesson with no one explaining it to you, but just by observing and watching the situation? You've maybe even been humbled by something that unfolds, and you were taught a lesson right in your spirit, you knew right away. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's teaching his disciples a lesson. He knew that there was this competitive spirit in his disciples. So he's crushing and killing their pride and selfishness by doing something that no one else wanted to do. I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't say, all right, now that I've washed your feet, you need to wash my feet. That would be cool. Like, I'd love to wash the feet of Jesus. He doesn't say that. He says, now that I've done this, I need you to go do this to each other. I need you to serve each other, to wash each other's feet, to be willing to do the job that nobody else wants to do. And that's how you show love to somebody. But for us to wash the feet of our family, our friends, our neighbors, to serve them, whatever it may be, that's a different story. That's more difficult. Max Lucado writes, the Lord of the universe is first day was spent in a barn, and his last was spent bending down, washing feet. Amazing. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Paul is writing, and he's sharing of the humility of Jesus Christ, and um, he's kind of laying this out for us. And these are some um, very convicting but powerful verses in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Let me pause there. Don't even serve out of selfish ambition. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, be, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
I'm so thankful that Jesus saves us from our sins. I'm so thankful that Jesus saves us from our selfishness, right? I'm so thankful that Jesus saves us from shallow attitudes. See, the world says to look out for number one. The world says to show off your degree. The world says to climb the ladder of success. And Jesus says to deny yourself, to think more highly of others than yourself. The world looks for status. Jesus is looking for servants. The world will ask you, how many employees do you have? How many social media followers do you have? Jesus is asking us, who are you serving? The greatest leader of all washed feet and then says, go do the same. He was sovereign, yet Jesus took the place of a servant. He had all things in his hands, yet he picked up a towel. He was Lord and master, yet he, he served his followers. Let's lay aside the garment of pride and selfishness. Like Jesus took off that garment, let's take off the, pri the garment of pride and selfishness and let's pick up the towel of humility. Let's pick up the, the garment of a servant and serve people. See, the attitude of the servants or the disciples back then was this. At the meal, they were like, Jesus, you know, I, I need to be served. Uh, come serve me. And sometimes we have this attitude in our society too as well. Serve me, 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 it's about me. But the attitude of Jesus was this. He took the towel and he places it on himself and says, how can I serve? What can I do? Jesus wasn't asked to do this. He just saw something that needed to be done and he did it. Listen, Jesus was not the CEO of foot washing, right? He just got up and did it. There's a story that I want to share with you. Uh, man, I'm a, I'm a diehard Hawkeye fan. Um, and so there's a, 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 a team just north of here that, um, <laughs> that they have some good stuff too. But there's a really cool story that I want to share with you. So it's kind of hurt me on the inside to share this, but um, it goes perfectly with today. They have a football player named Joel Laney. And those of you who follow the team, you know much more about him than I do. But he just finished up, I believe, his senior year of playing linebacker for the, the Cyclones. But he didn't go to college to play that. He actually went to college to play quarterback. And um, it was something that... Um, he loved and he was very good at it. He was a great quarterback. But late in, I think, his junior season, um, they had another quarterback that was doing just a little bit better. And so they put in this new quarterback, um, and they, it was successful. It was good. But Coach Matt Campbell thought, it, it's not right. One of our best players is not on the field. And so he got with the coaches, and he thought, how can we get um, Joel Lanning involved somewhere on the field? He's got to touch the field. He's got to be touching the ball at some point. And so... Of, out of all the ideas they came up with, uh, Coach Matt Campbell came up with this ambitious idea of moving him from quarterback to linebacker. All right, this is, this is not just an easy switch that you make in middle school and you just learn a couple plays and just get out there and go tackle someone. Like the learning curve for that position is very steep. You are like the quarterback of the defense. And so he's going from an offensive mindset to a defensive mindset. And um, that's, that was a, this was a big deal, all right? This is a big switch. And so Coach Matt Campbell approaches Joel Lanning and here's what Lanning said. Sure, why not? I'll do anything to help the team. I want to say that again. Sure, why not? I'll do anything to help the team. See, Lanning, he could have been a graduate transfer to another college right away, not have to sit out a season, and he could have played quarterback for another school his final season. But instead, he, he, was, he sacrificed the position that he had gone to school for, he had trained most of his career for, to help the team. And I'm praying that, that that's the mentality that we can have, not just here at New Hope, but serving, uh, serving people in general. That we're, they're willing, we're willing to do whatever we can to help the team, to help New Hope out, to, to help people know more about Jesus. There's three stewardship principles that we hear about, serving God with our time, our talents, and our treasures. Pastor Weaver spoke a couple weeks ago about our treasures, about giving, um, our time. Listen, we can serve God with our time, but I want you to know that it's not going to fit into your schedule all the time. It might disrupt, when you choose to serve, it might disrupt your busyness, uh, your, your talents. We're all gifted. We're all uh, gifted in certain areas. And we can serve in those areas, and I encourage you to do so. But I do want you to know this. Listen, Jesus, that wasn't like his only gift, right? He wasn't like he perfected the art of foot washing. He just did something because there was a need there. And so I challenge us to think like, let's think beyond just what we normally would do here at New Hope. And what are some other areas we can be involved in? 
There's a, there's a quote that I read this week, and it's, it'll be up on the screen. It says, serving isn't going to be convenient. It's going to be a sacrifice. Serving isn't going to be convenient. It's going to be a sacrifice. Here's what I think. When there's an opportunity to serve, it might be uncomfortable and might be not fitting in into your schedule. And I think uh, that God is wanting to teach us more by our willingness to serve more than just what the need is represented. Does that make sense? I think God wants to shape our hearts like he did for the disciples. He was trying to crush their, their pride and their selfishness. And I think sometimes when we get involved and it's a sacrifice to serve somewhere, sometimes God is teaching us more than what we're actually contributing to. Does that make sense? And so I encourage you to open up your heart to what God maybe has for you. I've been here late on a Sunday or Saturday night, and there's been people here cleaning because it's the only time that worked in their schedule. The tech team, they've been here late nights over and over again for several events when they could have been with their family. But they're serving, they're sacrificing. So here's the thought. If this is your church, let's serve somewhere. If this is your church, if New Hope is your church, your home church, Please serve somewhere. Get involved somewhere. There's a story in, in the book of Luke that, that Mary and Martha um, are hosting Jesus and others. And Martha is busy. What? She's preparing. She's doing a lot of things. And Mary, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And a lot of uh, criticism sometimes goes to Martha. And th because the point of the story is like, learn to do what's more important and, and just be soaked up with Jesus. And so here's my thought to you guys as, as we close out this time. At New Hope, let's serve one and let's attend one. Let's serve like Martha. Let's be involved. What she was doing was not wrong. There's a job that needed to be done, but Mary also attended. She was at the feet of Jesus. Listen, to have Christ-like compassion, we need to be um, constantly being filled with the love of Jesus Christ, right? Otherwise, we're going to serve out of, um, you know, just our own wants and needs, and that's not right. Would you stand with me this morning? I do want you to, to bring attention to the final verse once again. Jesus says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Notice he doesn't say, now that you know them, you will be blessed. He says, now that you know them, you'll be blessed if you do them. Jesus doesn't ask us to memorize this story. He asks us to be like him. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. So we serve out of compassion and love. Here's why we do this, guys. Here's why we serve. Because we want people to know about Jesus, right? As, as simplest form as possible. We want people to know about Jesus and grow in their faith. Here's why we serve out of, out of humility. Because it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. He set the model for us. He set the example for us on how to serve. Let's have that same spirit within us. So here's what's going to happen in just a moment. Pastor Weaver is going to come up and pray. And the, the altar call today is a call to action. In the lobby are many ministries represented here. And every one of them need, is looking for more help. They're looking for more people to be involved in. And so I encourage you, would you just in your spirit ask God, where is it that I can jump in? Where can I be involved in? And we understand some of you may need to take a couple weeks and think about this. We totally get this. Some of you are very involved in the ministry, and here's what I ask you to do. You may not have time for more, and we totally get that. But would you go maybe to a couple tables and just thank the person that is in charge of that area? Thank you for serving. Thank you for cleaning. Thank you for helping this out. Because, because if everybody does their part, the church and Jesus Christ wins, right? So I'm going to leave this thought with you, like I said at the beginning. The church works best when every person serves. So pastor's going to come up and pray. And if you are wanting to know more about Jesus Christ, you want to grow in your faith, you want to make him Lord and Savior of your life, I'm going to be at the fresh, or the, the, the fresh start uh, table in the lobby. Would you please come see me and visit with me? I want to pray with you and talk with you. But um, I do thank you guys for being an amazing church.